Okay. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to Who Do You Think You Are 2017. And welcome to the DNA workshop sponsored by Family Tree DNA and supported by uh, volunteers like myself from ISOG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. So anybody who wants to join the society is completely free. If you're interested in DNA testing, I would encourage you to join ISOG. The stand is right here behind us, and the Family Tree DNA stand is over here as well. And they're offering the cheapest uh, DNA test at the, uh, at the exhibition, so do check out the stand over there. There's lots of um, volunteers like myself from ISOG who are very, very happy to answer any of the DNA questions that you have. So we have quite a jam-packed program for you this weekend, and we're going to start off with Linda Magellan. And Linda will be talking to us about some of the basics of DNA testing, DNA for beginners. Uh, Linda is an independent professional genetic genealogist. Uh, she has traveled internationally, assisted individuals in the discovery of their ancestry through the use of DNA testing, and she enjoys putting the pieces of the puzzle together to solve the mystery of one's genetic inheritance. Now she comes to us all the way from California, and it uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce you to her. So please give a warm welcome for Linda Magellan. Thank you. Um, thank you, Morris. It's actually pronounced Magellan. <laughs> Magellan. Um, so I am excited to be here. This is my first time talking here in uh, the UK. Um, so very exciting. And just to get us started, I'm going to go over um, the basics of DNA. Let me get this in. I'm going to go over the basics of DNA. I'm going to go over the three different types of tests that you can actually take. Um, and uh, we're going to try to determine what your goals are. We're also going to go over a few of the tools that are available for you to use and uh, keeping your own database. So how many of you, and just give me a show of hands, how many of you have um, heard about DNA testing? and have actually tried it, or, <laughs> okay, uh, so a few. And how many have, have you have known somebody who's done DNA testing? Okay. Good. Good. And how many have actually done the DNA test yourself? Yeah? Cool. Very cool. So, um, so most of us here look like maybe beginners, so uh, basically what uh, DNA does, we're going to go over the basics of DNA, and um, so we have the nucleus of the DNA is right in here on the human cell, and this is where our chromosomes are. We also have the mitochondrial down here, this is the, um, and I will talk about mitochondrial DNA in a little bit. but. Um, we really didn't come here for a, a lesson on uh, uh, the basics of DNA. Basically, what we're saying is you have dad, you have mom, you had a baby, okay? The baby got its DNA from both mom and dad, the chromosomes are passed down um, from, from the parents. And you also have brothers and sisters, but they don't all look alike. They look similar. And in a lot of families, they look really close. They don't really all look alike. So what's going on that causes that? What's well, those 23 pair of chromosomes that we inherit? Um, 22 of the pair of chromosomes are, the first 22 are um, what we call autosomal chromosomes. They recombine. So with every uh, child that's born, they will get part of their DNA from mom and part from dad, but they won't get the exactly the same parts, okay? So I look like my mom, I look like a little bit like my dad, my brother looks a little bit like mom, a little bit like dad, but my brother and I do not look anything alike, okay? Um, so, and then we have our third pair of chromosomes, which is the sex chromosome, the X and the Y, and we'll talk about those again in a, in a few minutes. Um, but basically what's happening is these 22 pair autosomal chromosomes is what we're going to talk about today. Um, oops. 
So what you before you start um, doing testing, what you need to determine is uh, you need to know what types of tests there are, and you also want to know what your goals are. Don't just go out there and take a test just for the sake of taking a test. Um, especially like when you come over to one of the stands, uh, have with you your question in mind about what it is you want to try to solve, what mystery you want to try to solve. Because the test that you take will help you solve the mystery. You take the wrong test, it's not going to help you at all, and you're going to be disappointed. We don't want that. So what is your goal? There's three different types of tests. And in the tests themselves, we have our Y-DNA test. Showing this again, we have the Y-DNA test, which is used in surname projects. We also have the mitochondrial DNA test, and that's used for family, uh, for females, and tracing your female line. And then we have the autosomal DNA test, and that's used to find cousins from all of your ancestral lines. So again, based on your question, you're going to take one of these three types of tests. So this is just a little diagram of where the Y is the direct male lineage. And you can see it starts with your ancient uh, male, and it's the Y chromosome is passed down from father to son. It goes virtually unchanged for thousands of years, um, and it's passed down to you if you're a male. Okay, so only the men receive a Y chromosome. Only men are going to be able to take that test. The mitochondrial DNA is a little bit different here passed down from females. Now, the mother passes her mitochondrial down to her children. So if you are female, you're going to have mitochondrial. If you're male, you're going to have mitochondrial. And you can take the, both male and female can take this test. But the, it's only going to give you information about your female line. It's not going to do any good to afford your surname project if you take the mitochondrial DNA test. So mother passes her mitochondrial down to both of her children, both sexes, male or female, but only the female passes it on again. So men cannot pass down mitochondrial DNA. That's why it's a female line only. And then we have the autosomal. Autosomal DNA test is for all of your, um, all 30, oops, Sorry, all 30, uh, like going back generations, all of your uh, male and female ancestors going back five, six uh, generations. You inherit your DNA from mom and dad. They got it from their parents. Back again, back again. Going back about, based on the uh, percentage of DNA that you have in common with somebody else, you can tell at what, what uh, um, generation that you can actually uh, determine whether your first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, because that percentage of DNA that you share came from a common set of ancestors and maybe it was passed down here on the female line, but maybe they also had a son and passed it down to somebody else and that's where your uh, match is coming from. So this autosomal DNA test whether you're male or female, you can take the test and you can compare results with both men and women. So um, this is working your AT off, okay? Autosomal DNA, working the AT at family tree DNA. And um, I'm choosing this one. Uh, you have uh, autosomal testing at various other companies but I'm choosing this one for the purposes of the fact that they have tools available that help you to actually work with your DNA to, um, to do more research. So here we are, our autosomal DNA again. Autosomal DNA is, makes up over 95% of your DNA. So again, let me stress, it does not include your Y DNA. It does not include mitochondrial DNA. So these are different tests for different purposes. We receive half, again, from each parent. And um, depending on how much you share, a specific, uh, 
of DNA that you can determine what the specific ancestor was. So when you and I share DNA in common, and um, we call these parts segments, a segment is a block or a chunk or a string of DNA, um, and you and your match have shared segments. So shared segments is a good thing. Uh, it, that equals your common ancestor when those big chunks of DNA. So who matches? Um, you're going to have cousins that match. So close relatives will always match. Your, uh, and you'll see this in some of my slides. Parents, aunts, uncles, first cousins, second cousins. Other cousins begin to drop off matching because as generations come down and as the DNA is passed down again, it recombines. Um, it changes. You're getting those chunks of DNA, but you're also getting chunks from other people too. So even though we shared the same common ancestor, not the same chunks came down all of the time. And so that's why it may get smaller as it gets smaller as generations go back. So fourth, third cousins matching about 90% of the time. Fourth cousins about 50% of the time they're going to show up in your matches. Fifth cousins about 10% of the time you're going to get. And um, sometimes you might have a specific cousin that doesn't show up just because even though you followed the paper trail, they might not show up because they didn't actually receive the DNA enough of it to be exactly the same and be considered a match. So here's a little chart, and you can get this online. This chart um, shows you the percentage of DNA that um, so here you are, yourself, your parents, you have 50% of your DNA from each parent. That makes 100% of you. Your children are going to have 50% of your DNA in them. That makes sense. Your grandparents, you get 25% from each grandparent. And remember, it's recombining, so it's not exactly the same 25% that your brother or sister got, but it is 25% from each grandparent. You, like I said, you can go online and get this chart. It's a nice chart to have in order to, um, when you start getting your percentages of matches and how much they match you, you can go and look and see what generation you might want to start looking at for a common ancestor. This is a very good tool to have. So I'm going to use myself as an example here. This is my um, family tree. As I log into my account on Family Tree, um, this is the first page that I come to. Oops, sorry about that. I have my um, my family tree. They allow us to put on, uh, they give us the opportunity to put in our GenCon and to upload it to so that we have an actual family tree that we can look at. Um, we have our Family Finder matches. This is those autosom the autosomal test that I was that I'm talking about. This is the um, little place the uh, tools that you will use. Also, I have mitochondrial DNA. I have that test done, and so it shows my matches and other things there. We'll go over each of these now. Um, so here is Family Finder matches for me. And as you can see, this is all, all of my matches. I have 2,697 matches there. Um, I uh, filtered these as the closest and the longest block is um, the first ones that I'm seeing. Christina Dawn is my daughter. Danielle is my daughter. And you can see uh, we have um, quite a bit longest blocks and we also have an X match here and I've listed them as daughter. I've not put in their ancestral names but I know them. Roy here is my brother. He is a full sibling. It's estimated that he is a full sibling as I've listed him as my brother. You can go in and make these changes. Um, you'll see my brother and I, even though we have 50% of our DNA from mom and dad, each, um, he, is, he has less 
than my daughters. He shares less than my daughters. But that's because um, he is recombined, the recombining again that I was talking about. Joshua is a grandson. And you can see he's listed here as um, either a half sibling, a grandparent, a grandchild, an aunt, uncle, and niece and nephew. And like I said, he's a grandson, so I've listed him as a grandson. We get down to um, some other ones. Let me go on. Um, and do some sorting here, uh, or pending relationships. Excuse me, I thought I had sorting. This. Pending relationships. These are people who think that they're who genetically match me. They have common DNA, and they've said, "I am your distant cousin," um, and do I want to confirm the match? On things I haven't yet, but um, then we go on to the next tab. Your known relationships. This is where I marked my daughter and my grandson and a first cousin. I confirm them here as either being um, uh, what they say they are, or I don't, or I remove them. Moving on to my origins. Uh, this is one of the tabs that we that we saw on uh, the very first page that I showed you. My origins gives you your ethnic uh, makeup. Here we have myself and my brother. And remember again, I'm going to point this out several times, um, that the autosomal DNA recombines. So even though I got 50% from mom and 50% from dad, I didn't get, my brother didn't get the same 50% from mom and the same 50% from dad. He got a recombination, okay? So that is what explains the difference in our actual um, ethnic um, breakdown here. You can see that, um, let me just point this out. I have right in here, I have some um, Middle Eastern and, um, oh no, this is what I want to point out, the Jewish diaspora, my brother does not have that at all in him, okay? And that's because of that recombination and I got that particular thing, probably, I'm guessing it was from my dad, I don't know for sure, but I think that I got a portion of DNA that my brother didn't from my dad, okay? And I think that's what actually has made that up. So, and this gives you a breakdown of, um, you know, what you are, European, British Isles, Middle Eastern, and a the Asia Minor. Nice little graphic here. Here we have our chromosome browser. The chromosome browser um, here all of this dark blue area, that's me. That represents half of my chromosomes, or represents my chromosomes, okay? And as I add people, this is a tool that you can use. You can go in and you can compare um, larger segments. Right here at, uh, I have it set at five uh, centimorgans, but you can go up or down a little bit with those. You can go to 10 centimorgans, or you can go down to three. Um, and here I have uh, the filter set to close to the immediate family. So it lists all of those people that are closely related to me. And I'm going to show you some comparisons. Here in the orange, I've added my brother. And you can see we share a lot of DNA in common, okay? And as I go through, we actually have shared segments, 51 segments that are shared, and they're shown right here. You can't see all of them down here. There's 20, there's 22 and the X, but the slide wasn't big enough. Here I've added my uh, half-sister. My, sister, my brother and I share both parents in common. My half-sister, we only share a mom in common, okay? And you can see that we actually share less in common. She's not a full sibling, so she shows up with less DNA in common with me than my full sibling brother does. Next, I've added um, a first cousin. So as you go through and you start looking at these, you can see where we actually share DNA in common 
all, all four of us, we share certain segments in common. And here, the next one, I've added a um, second cousin. So he has even less. He's in the, um, oops. He's in the pink. So he has even less because we're going back another generational level, okay? I add this one in here. Jill is actually, um, I also have a half-sibling brother, and she is the, his daughter. So Jill is um, my niece from a half-sibling. One of the things I want to point out here is that Jill is in the yellow, and if you look there and look at my half-sibling sister, remember I said we share a mother in common, and she's, her father and I are half-siblings through our father. So even though Jill in the yellow also shares DNA, it looks like here it, that she shares DNA in common with my sister, she doesn't, okay? What you're seeing is you're seeing the half, half, Jill shares DNA in common with me, and Ellen shares DNA in common with me. This is not comparing Jill and Ellen, okay? This is only comparing to me. So even though Jill is listed here, it looks like she shares DNA in common. Remember, we're do, we have, um, it's a half segment that we're showing here, and she's showing up showing to me, but she's not really in common with Ellen. And the way you would check this is to um, look at Ellen's actual results, and you'll see that Jill is not listed anywhere on Ellen's um, results, okay? Here we have um, our, the same information but it's listed in a chart, in a table, table view format, and you can see, this is for my brother. It lists the chromosomes that he, we actually share, the start location, the end location, the number of centimorgans, and the number of matching SIPs. Um, SIPs is single nucleotide polymorphisms. SIPs for short, because we don't want to say that word a lot. <laughs> Um, family finder matches again. We're back here to um, to my family finder matches. And what I am doing here is I'm actually showing you that let me see, my 2,697, and of those, um, 107 of those matches are listed as my paternal. Uh, 10,000, I uh, know 1,000. 37 are listed as mature on my maternal side, and um, two of them are listed as both. Okay. Up here, I'm going to go back one. Uh, is James? Okay. So here I selected James, and I've hit this in common with button. This is a tool that you'll want to use often because now I've taken my matches down from that 2,000 number down to 90 matches. James is listed here, and 90 matches in common with both James and me, okay? James matches me. I want to find out who else matches James and me at the same time. And you can do that on any one of these. All you have to do is just put a check mark in this box here. James and who who else he's in common with. And that gives me 90 matches that total. 19 of those are on my um, dad's side. 28 of those are on um, my mother's side. Two, it looks like have, have both. And that's probably like my daughter's, you know, or something like that. Um, and... Uh, then the rest, you know, they haven't put in their um, jet comps on that family tree page. And we haven't actually been able to determine which side yet. But this is a nice tool to have this in common with. And they also have it for not in common with. So 
if I wanted to uh, say, okay, I know that um, the nice thing about having half siblings is that I know that if you are related to my sister, then you're going to be on my mother's side. And if you're related to um, Jill, then you're going to be on my dad's side. So, um, and that's when I would actually use the not in common with. I might check off my sister. If you don't, ha if you don't have DNA in common with my sister, then you're going to you are going to end up in my dad's bucket instead of in my mom's bucket. Okay. Um, here again, we have. James is listed as, um, this is the Family Finder Matrix, and I wanted to show you that James is here. It shows, this is James, it shows that he is um, a match for, who is that, Cora, and not a match for Elvin. He's a match for Roy, my brother. He is a match for um, my niece, Jill, not a match for my sister. So what that kind of indicates to me is that these people here that he does match are all on my father's side and this is ellen is my mother's side and rosa is my mother's side also and so i know that i'm matching james because of a relative on my father's side i need to be looking in my father's side of the tree in order to determine who our common ancestor is Steps to success. So in order to be successful, at, you need to start keeping track of what, of what you're doing, okay? Um, you're going to develop a really robust ancestral tree. So if you're not already using some sort of uh, tracking method or some sort of application, then I highly recommend that you use something to make a family tree. Um, you're, and put everything in there. I say throw in the kitchen sink. Um, but seriously, I have probably one of the largest family trees, but it helps me when I'm trying to figure out how you're related to me. Um, you're also going to, when, you, when your matches come up, you're gonna look for the common ancestor. You can't do that if you haven't built a really big family tree. You need to put in siblings, you need to put in siblings' um, spouses, you need to put in the siblings' children, you need, you, for everyone, just keep building and building. It's going to work if you do it that way. Um, make a JEDCOM and upload it to Family Tree uh, DNA on that family, um, family Tree page. This is really important, I can't stress this again. If you have that family tree up there, it will help you in sorting. Remember I said that um, some of them were related to me on my father's side and some were related, some of my matches showed up as related on my mother's side. The reason I can get that is because I put that family, uh, the, my JEDCOM up on the family tree DNA website on my particular page. Okay. Um, list dates and places and list every surname that you have on, on, the, on your family tree DNA page or if you're testing with another company, with that other company, if they have that web page um, or the ability to do that. List them because every time you have a match, people are gonna, the person you're matching with is going to go looking for their surname or their surnames that you know, in their ancestry. So, um, and if you have unique names, like Smith is not a unique name, but his first name is Jackson Hicks Smith. That's makes him more uncommon than say John Smith. Okay. So list those things. And and so I say, get ready. Good news, most of you have already started this, but de develop a standard um, email message that you're going to respond to people that you match with. As the matches come up, you're going to want to send out an email right away and um, include your name, your email, um, include the name of your match. This is really important 
Um, I actually monitor about 40 different kits. Um, my daughters, my grandson, my first cousins, my second cousins, they've all tested because I asked them to. And so as such, I, I keep track of their information. So if you write to me, my email's on their, on their kits. So if you write to me and say, we're a match, I'm gonna say, um, okay, but who are you really matching? Do you match me? Do you match my first cousin? Do you match my second cousin? Who are you writing to me about? So include the name of the person. I know it's re it sounds redundant, but include the name of the person that you are actually matching in your email, okay? Um, so, and include a short description of your whole ancestry in general. Don't include stories, but just like I put, I say in my, you know, most of my heritage is um, the United States, it's early um, colonial America. So I, I put that one short sentence in my emails I, that I'm early colonial America. And so it just kind of gives them a starting place of where, you know, where we might be related. And be upbeat. Um, you, you want to try to identify that, that common ancestor. If you're saying, it's some, if you're being very negative about it, I don't know how we could possibly be related or something like that, they're, they're not going to respond to you. So be up, day, up, upbeat and also dangle a carrot. Something like, you know, um, I, can, I can help you out in your research too. You know, I'm willing to do the work and, um, you know, just give me what you have. Um, so in every email, <clears throat> you're going you're gonna to have developed that standard email and then you're going to uh, start looking. When they respond, you're going to start looking and sharing information. So, um, let's see, read and study everything that they send to you because, and this again goes back to developing that really robust family, tr family tree that you're putting up online because somewhere in your lineage is their ancestor and somewhere in their lineage is your ancestor. And so you're going to want everything that you put up there is going to be um, put in your family tree is going to be uh, useful, whether it's today or tomorrow or a year from now, you're gonna find that that little bit of information that maybe they came from a certain valley or a certain county or something like that, that may be very, very useful. So be sure to include every little tidbit that you get. And organize and track your emails on a spreadsheet. Um, so that you can get to them um, right away. Here's a sample email letter that I have uh, developed. And basically, um, I asked, whoops, again, I asked them, is your pedigree chart available online anywhere? Because I want to find, I want to go in and look at their chart and compare it to mine. And um, I, I tell them, I'd love to, you know, take a look at it and see who our ancestor is. And anything I discover, I will share with them. I want them to feel, get that warm, fuzzy feeling from me because this is a person, you're, it's like a cold call and you don't know them, but you're genetically related to them. So you want to try to build that warm, friendly relationship with them. It might take several emails and that's okay, but just continue to um, pursue it. Communicate and share everything. Um, again, look at every tree that you can. So when you're doing your research, and I, um, I know some people use um, a genie and some people use ancestry to put their tree up and stuff like that. But when you're doing your research, um, make sure that you, you look at the trees that have people in your ancestry that have them listed and look at the places and the time because you're, it's going to help you later. Research your matches tree and make note of anything that looks promising and keep that on that spreadsheet. So you've downloaded, um, we'll get to that in a minute, but you've downloaded your matches information 
and you've started a spreadsheet and you're going to want to make note of these things on that spreadsheet. This will help you to stay on task. It'll help you when you're communicating with them and it will help you um, to just know what you have already done and not have to duplicate services and work. Um, email, again, every time that you find something um, that might be just a little useful information, email your match and say, you know, what about this? You know, this might be where our common ancestor is. Were your, were your ancestors ever in this county or in that uh, region of uh, Europe? Or So email and share your research and ask questions. And once you start determining the common ancestors, um, you're going to find that it's usually the husband or wife of um, your match, okay? So I match you, but our common ancestor is a, probably the wife or the husband of some of one of our the parents. So I'm not sure how to explain that any better. <laughs> okay. Um, your, you and your match descend from different children of common ancestors. So that's what I'm trying to say. The, um, also, remember, too, um, that endogamous ancestors um, will give you um, more DNA in common. Okay, so if you fall into this category where you have, and I do, I have colonial American ancestry, so um, because they, there were a lot of uh, intermarriages, I have, you know, second cousins that married each other. So I'm going to, that gives me more DNA in common um, than if it was two separate people from two separate families that married each other. And keep track of alternative common ancestors. Many times you'll find that it might, you might have more than one common ancestor. So don't overlook um, the possibility that you could have gotten DNA from uh, two different ancestors that came down from both uh, your match and to you um, from the same two ancestors. So keep track of those alternatives, even though it may be slightly um, less it may be significant in the end. And record each common ancestor and matches. Um, that again, on your spreadsheet, you're gonna wanna record everything. So develop that spreadsheet, keep track of your matches, and um, keep track of the actual shared segments of DNA. This is your master inventory and working tool for autosomal. So I'm going to show you here, as you, um, on your Family Finder matches page, right down here in the very bottom corner, there's a little link that says download, um, and you can download it as a CSV file or an Excel file. You're going to download all, and what you will get is you will get their full name, the date that you actually matched them, the possible range, the suggested relationship, the number of shared centimorgans, your longest block, and if you've gone in and indicated that you know the relationship, you're going to that'll show up. You're going to get their email addresses. You're going to get if they put their ancestral lines, their surnames up there. You're going to get all of that, and their haplogroups. Make a column for notes. This is where you're going to put all of your stuff about what you have emailed, what your communications have been. Um, you, can, you can add to this. Uh, so I have a list of suggested uh, things that you might want to actually have in your spreadsheet. So of course, um, all of the things that come with the, uh, with the download itself you might want to include a line for the actual kit number if you know it, or the GED match ID, 
Also, you might, if you have tested with multiple companies, you'll want to include a line for um, for which company they matched you through. I have several people that match me through different companies because I've tested at three different companies. You might want to include um, the person's sex, their birth year, the known relationships, um, a, a lot of other things. And this is, I do have this online if you want to go and look at it, but a lot of these you're going to get with that download. Any, anything that you want to keep track of, you're going to want to include in the spreadsheet. It will help you in the end. Um, again, email sent. Include the full text of the email. I always do this because when I want to uh, communicate with you again, I don't want to have to go searching through my uh, my email folder. Okay. Um, spreadsheet tracking suggest suggested additional columns. This is an important one. Again, going back to the fact that I monitor 40 different kits. Um, so, who the the kit actually who donated the DNA? So my brother, okay. So his name would be on one column, but the point of contact is actually me. So if you're communicating with somebody that is a proxy for, for um, a kit, you're going to want to have two different columns that says who the actual person is that is tested and who the actual person is that's doing all of the legwork and um, getting everything done for you, you know, doing all the research. And so. Just a little review here. It's one step at a time. So get ready, develop your ancestral tree. And many of us have already done that. Develop a standard email message that you can send out right away when you first get your matches. And communicate, communicate, communicate. So share with every match, communicate and share, determine the common ancestor and um, develop that spreadsheet to keep track of everything. I think in the end, what's helped me most has been the spreadsheet and um, using the tools that I showed you on the Family Finder page. That's, those are the, the two things that have helped because I can determine whether they go into my mother's bucket or my father's bucket. And then I can start, I, that, that gives you only 50% of your tree that you have to actually work with. So keeping track and um, and building that tree and putting it up there on the Family Tree DNA website. When you log in, you're going to be the only person that, that um, you know, can actually add that. So you need to be doing that and developing the tree. And I think that's it. Questions? Thank, thanks, Linda. So, questions down here. Something about twins and identical twins. Yes. What DNA matches do they have? Well, they're going to have a, a lot more in common, and they're going to. I, but it has been proven that uh, even identical, identical. I can't say that word. <laughs> identical twins. Um, there are differences, and so yeah, because of that recombination. The, um, the autosomal DNA, even though they carry a, more than me and my brother, obviously, um, my, or my brother and I, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, yeah, they, they still do have some differences. And so, yeah. Cool. Other questions? Okay. I had a, I had a case of a uh, situation where somebody didn't know who their father was, but it was one of a set of identical twins. But they weren't able to determine which one it was, and they were wondering if DNA would actually ask, answer the question. But of course, if they're identical twins, then it's going to be very, very difficult to know if it was twin A or twin B who was the actual father. So, D DNA will, DNA will answer will a lot answer, of the questions, yes. but it won't answer every question. Yeah. We have a question down here. On the... Um uh, where it came up with your matches and it said uh, so many were 
uh, from your father and so many were from your mother. Does that do that automatically or is that down to what you've confirmed? No, it does it automatically. If you have put your family tree, if you've developed a family tree and uploaded the GEDCOM to, um, to your page, then it will start doing it automatically for you. So you have to have the tree up on Family Tree DNA first, which is a relatively, you can build it manually or you can do a JEDCOM file and that will just The JEDCOM goes really easy. If you already have, you know, like if you're using Family Tree Maker or Reunion or something like that, then um, just make a JEDCOM and upload it. It goes really, really easily. And you just attach your own DNA results to that, your yourself in the tree. And if you've yeah. tested the first cousin you had, his results to the first cousin in the tree, and then it automatically starts populating. These matches are on your mother's side of the family. These matches are on your father's side of the family. Right. The family Tree is the only uh, company that actually does that. That's correct. So it actually is a very, very useful feature, especially if you don't have a parent alive that you can test to see whether it's maternal or paternal. Yes, there's a question. Question over here. Um, Example in my own tree, we have two families, one in Canada and one here. Each family have traced their family tree back to um, a person and this two, we've got uh, male lines all the way down on both trees. This person is roughly within the same age group as the person in the Canadian tree and they lived about five miles from each other. So can we use, how can we use the DNA to see if they are actually brothers? Oh, well, so you can use your, the Y chromosome. You can test both, both of them because they're, they're both men. You can test the Y chromosome to verify that they actually share the common male ancestor. And that would be one way you can do it. The other way would be to do a family finder test, and that will give you, if, if they are actually brothers, it will get, it'll show a highly significant amount of DNA in common, and on uh, family tree will suggest the relationship, and it should come up as brothers. Right, so it's worthwhile getting the Canadians test, one of them to test, and yes. one of us to test. Yes. And they should have a 50% match, you know, they should right. be, they should share 50% of their DNA in common with each other, which is roughly about 3,300 Three. centimorgans, so it's huge. It is. Would that actually uh, show itself all the way down, sort of another six generations? Oh, I see what you mean. So oh. the brothers were several hundred years ago. Ah, okay. okay. So what is the relationship of the people today, today. in Canada and England? Is it fifth cousin? Is it fourth cousin? Is it third cousin? Ah, okay. There are, there are two males living within five miles of each other in about uh, early 1800s. Mm -hmm. And one family went to Canada, one family stayed here. We've got male lines down to, on both. So can we test my male cousin and a male in Canada and see if they join up with that confirm the relationship. Yes. Well, if they're early 1800s, then they're, they're wanna... probably fourth cousins, because that would be my great-great-great-grandfather was right. one of the early 1800s. So you're looking at a great-great-great-grandfather on that side, a great-great-great-grandfather on that side, and it would be the four times great-grandfather that was the common ancestor, meaning that people today would be about fifth cousin fifth level. Cousins. Fifth cousins, you only have maybe a 10% chance of actually showing that there is a connection. But if it's males, father, right. father, father, up on one side, and father, 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 up on the other side, it would you could be do a Y, y DNA, DNA test. test. Um, and that would prove that they share a common male ancestor. And based on the fact that you've done your genealogical research, your paper trail research, um, you can infer that that common male ancestor is that fifth generation back. You can try to do a autosomal test, and that would, um, hopefully, they would be in that 10%. The thing about doing the autosomal is, um, so do the men, but if there are any other um, fourth cousins alive, 
I would, I would do multiple cousins. I would test on both sides. I would do multiple cousins because that increases your odds of having a match come through. From in Australia as well, mm -hmm. it's proven ancestry, but they're not necessarily in the male line, male all the way down. That's fine. You can do the autosomal test for that one. Uh, and the important thing would be to test the oldest generation possible, because right. if you're a fifth cousin, then a generation further up will be a fourth cousin. And if you can test even two generations further up, like a grandfather or a grandparent, that'll be third cousins. And the amount of DNA that you'll share uh, with between third cousins is so much greater than between fifth cousins. Right. So it'd be better to test my father rather than my male cousin. Yes. Yeah. It, it, so it's it, one generation back. Yes. Test your father and test your male cousin's father, if possible. No. Yeah. Cool. Great. Okay, well, thanks very much, Linda, for a very instructive talk. Linda Magellan.